introduced by art historian Yashaswini Chandra. We are delighted to introduce our guests. B.N. Goswami um, is the Professor Emeritus of Art History at the Punjab University in Chandigarh. He has received numerous awards, including the Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship, the Padma Shri, and the Padma Bhushan from the President of India. Yashaswini Chandra is the author of The Tale of the Horse, A History of India on Horseback. She holds a PhD from SOAS University of London, and her research interests include the arts and cultures of the Himalaya, Rajasthan, and Mughal India, animal history, and women's studies. We look forward to an excellent session. Thank you. I shall be introducing Professor Goswami. It is a tremendous honor for me to introduce Professor B.N. Goswami, but also a daunting task, because how do you put into words the achievements of an expert who has towered Colossus-like over the fields of South Asian art and cultural history? Professor Goswami has dedicated his life to the study of Indian art, beginning at a time when the scholarship on the subject was limited and given us new ways of thinking, seeing, and even feeling. His profound dedication to aesthetics is matched by his commitment to social understanding. He impressed upon us the distinctive style of Pahari painting as the traditions that developed in the small but sophisticated courts of the lower Indian Himalayas from the 17th century are collectively called. In many ways, it represents the apogee of Indo-Persianate art. But even as he revealed its romance and lyricism, he uncovered the role of the artists and their journeys in the development of this school. He gave to us the genius of one family of Pahari painters, Pandit Seo and his sons, Nensuk and Manaku and their descendants. Professor Goswami applied the same forensic approach combined with instinct and inspiration to highlight the personalities of artists who worked in different traditions across India in a magnum opus called Master Painters of India. The culmination of his work on painting encompassing Jain and Buddhist manuscript illustration, Mughal painting, and the different courtly and folk traditions of Rajasthan is a masterpiece of a book called The Spirit of Indian Painting. Professor Goswami's interests or expertise aren't restricted to painting or even art, aesthetics, and historiography. They include literature, music, flora and fauna, among others. His diverse passions animate each other, and this is borne out in the book we are here to discuss today, Conversations, India's leading art historian engages with 101 themes and more. Moreover, we are truly privileged to hear him speak about it. If his erudition isn't enough, he is the most eloquent speaker. And as with all his talks, he is bound to transport us as he opens a window to Indian art and culture, bringing in the diverse, bringing in the aspects of affect and sensation and all the realizations they can stimulate. So I give to you the legendary Professor Goswami. Thank you very much, Yash Aswini. Most kind. When you get to my age, most people speak to themselves. And I could see that the, the impact of this particular thing, when I saw lots of people leaving, this man is going to talk about himself or talk to himself. But I'm talking about a book that just appeared 
titled Conversations. Who am I conversing with? That is the first question I would ask myself. This is a collection of essays, short essays, and I've in the beginning said these are slight sketches of large subjects. I've been writing in for a long number of years, a column in the Tribune in Chandigarh, and it's a selection of that. So nobody really has to be aware of what has gone on before. And this is an easy book to put down away and so on, so because you can open it at any particular leaf and close it. What do these essays contain? What are these essays about? They're unconnected, completely unconnected. But I was moved by, I put down on paper. What is it, Faisal said, that this is what we are there for, for feeding the field of knowledge to the extent that we can. There should be an image on the screen. It's not there yet. I hope the next one will show. Could we have the slides, please? The first slide. Not yet. And there it is. Just keep it at the back of your mind. 30 words and an astonishing achievement based on uh, seeing a book, Mantakutair, by the great Sufi Rumi. 30 birds which take flight to find the greatest bird that is there in the world. But I'll come to that a bit later. Let me begin by sharing with you what moved me. Long years ago in Zurich, there was an extraordinary event, the Festival of India, and a great troop from Kerala had arrived there, and they were going to perform the Kuriyattam play in the evening. And Kuriyatam is a highly stylized thing and so on, as you know, all of you know that. And it takes, I mean, one character, for instance, on the stage would take about eight or nine minutes to die or something like that. And so very, very slow, very stylized. A friend of mine who was director of the museum, Eberhard Fischer, said, me, most people don't know anything about this particular form of art. So, I'm going to invite people to see how these people prepare to get onto the stage, the time it takes to put on their makeup and so on. So I was given the doubtful assignment of explaining to people what is going on. So there I went to in a hall, and there were these actors who were going to go on the stage in the evening. And there, one man lying down on his back, his head in the lap of another person who's very slowly, patiently applying one pigment after another on the face. And these, I mean, the German speaking Swiss figures, friends of the museum, would walk past. And it went on and on and on. And one of them said, I mean, these days you get all kinds of new materials for makeup and so on. So why are they taking so long? And there was the Guruji, who was the head of the organization. And with, I mean, he was a Guruji is a Guruji. So he could have been very short tempered. Fortunately, he wasn't. And I addressed this question to him. I said, Guruji, they are asking, why is it taking so long? He says, Chacha, they don't know anything. I said, obviously not, otherwise they won't be asking the question. And he said, 
these people must know that this evening we are going to enter the world of the gods and we need this silence to prepare ourselves for that i must tell you i must deeply moved i really was very very moved and a simple question a like difficult question but easily answered by a man who knew what it was all about so that was the first essay the meaning of silence which i wrote in this particular series what i'm saying is simply this there have been things that have moved me things that would i hope would move other people also so i kept writing i'll share with you a few things right now next one please this is not an entertainment it's a piece of calligraphy by a great syrian calligrapher of today most people don't know anything about art at all and they are reluctant to ask questions before their ignorance is revealed <clears throat> so i show this as an example of how difficult it is to enter this particular world an extraordinary piece now if you are familiar with the arabic or this persian script and so on you will recognize some letters jeem dal dal or something like that and so on and then you lose yourself so there is a natural inbuilt difficulty in interpreting and entering the world of art but let's see let's go to the next slide please this is the image a detail from a larger painting that is on the cover of that particular book and since it was conversations i thought i'll take a little snippet from another painting and show how conversations can take place next one this is from that particular painting you will recognize it i'll pass over this quickly because i don't have too much to say in this next one this is from a bhagavat puran leaf and kans is being informed that krishna is going to be born or has been born and so silent quiet conversations are going on next one next one please next this is just for the pleasure of it i mean how extraordinary the detailing in this is but i'll come to you in a minute next one please next next one now this is a painting that very few people would know much about and it's an extraordinary episode in the mantakotair by a great sufi writer it's a story is a little like this and you give me two minutes attention a bird hudhud by name says to all the birds that who is the most beautiful let's decide and every bird puts up his or her claim the peacock says i am the most beautiful the you know hawk says i am really the most efficient and so on so forth he says no 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 the real the absolutely the creme de la creme the at the very top is the sea murg sea murg is the bird of paradise and they say have you seen the sea murg he says no many people say no many of the birds say no we don't have any knowledge of what the sea murg is like he says i can take you there but it's a very long very difficult journey and they say we'll ready so they start flying he said we'll go through seven valleys the valley of despair the valley of love the valley of anticipation the valley of silence and so on so we'll have to move in that particular fashion so all birds begin after some time many of them drop off and so on so forth and then ultimately only 30 birds 
reach that particular spot where the Hud Hud has promised them that I will show you the Seymour. And when they get there, <coughs> the bird said, where is the Seymour? And he said, you are the Seymour. The word Sea means 30. Murg is bird. You are the Seymour. Realize yourself. Extraordinary story. Extraordinary. And then he said immediately after that, he said, look at yourself. And then a great big mirror descends from the heavens on high. <clears throat> and all of them look into that mirror, dive into it and finish. For now, the ultimate, absolutely the ultimate end of self-realization. Some painter, I'm sorry, this is not me, I right. <clears throat> Some painter had the imagination to put 30 birds into this form. Count them, if you like. Count them. Now, if you work like this, certainly you what would you make of it? Unless you know what the great Sufi had written in the Mantakul Tair. So my attempt has been, and I'm not selling the book incidentally, my attempt has been in a certain sense to make things as accessible as possible. If I'm moved by it, I'll say why I'm moved by it. Next one. This is another version where birds gather together and decide among themselves who is the most beautiful. Next one. Next one. An image. It's a small bronze in an American museum now, 14th century from India. It is published as the tree of life and knowledge. Fair enough. But do we understand what is going on in this? It has the appearance of a tree, of course. But we have to decode it. We really have to decode it. If there's the branches of the tree like this, the trunk of the tree, and inside the branches, there are certain things which you don't immediately recognize. But let me try and interpret what is it. In the heart of the, of the tree, in the crown, there is a chakra. So immediately when you see a chakra, and also in a snake, then you start thinking of Vishnu, right? Sheshanaga, Sudarshan Chakra, and so on and so forth. You come down, and around the trunk of the tree, two monkeys with crowns on their heads. So immediately start thinking of the Ramayana, Hangad, Hanuman, and so on. When you come down further, at the foot of the tree, there are two cows. And the moment you see cows in connection with the trunk of the tree, or with the tree, you think of Krishna playing upon his flute and the cows gather together. But is there more to it? Next one, please. At the edge of each branch, delicately poised, are figures of Hansa birds. Each thing ending with a Hansa bird. What does the Hansa bird do? The Hansa bird is the ultimate decider of what is to be kept and what is to be left out. Nir Kshir Vivek. It is a mythical bird. If you place a bowl of water mixed with milk, the Hansa bird will drink only milk and leave water behind discrimination. Is that what this sculpture is about? You decide. These birds around that and so on, it could also be the incoming breath and the outgoing breath that the yogis say. 
Hansa, Hansa, like this and so on. And that turns into Soham, Soham, something like that. So there are layers in the works of art, which I'm talking about, which we really have to make an effort, so to speak, to uncover. Next one, please. It's a small piece. It is not a great big sculpture. Next one, please. The Indian understanding of time is vastly different from any other. Vastly different. And time is represented by Indian painters in their own highly intelligent and abstract fashion. It's a hunting scene from Rajasthan, Mewar. A ruler, Sagram Singh, is down there and he has a gun in his hand. It's a tiger shoot that we are looking at. When you go to the Jaipur Museum here, some guide will take you there and show you a hunting scene. And then he would say, how many tigers do you see in it? And most people say five, seven, and so on. No, no, no. They're not five or seven tigers, one tiger. And it is that tiger is shown once, twice, three times, four times, and so on. Time is being collapsed. Seventeen times the same tiger appears in this particular painting. It's just one tiger. So suddenly, I mean, these ideas spring up from somewhere and you are first, I mean, big, to begin with, completely foxed by it all. And then when you relate it to the Indian sense of time and how it can be treated, you discover things. Next one. In a Surda's painting, Sur Sagar, where the great blind poet is sitting at the bottom right corner, and he's written a text. And the text is written at the very top. One day, Radha says to Krishna, let's exchange roles, right? To Radha, Hosham, you become Radha and I'll become Krishna, right? exchange of clothes, exchange of personalities. And this verse is now interpreted by the painter in 11 different episodes, where to begin with Krishna, who's recognizable with dark complexion, and Radha, of course, is beloved. They're in the proper position, Krishna playing upon the flute and Radha by his side. And then the next thing changes. The next thing changes. He becomes she and she becomes he, and so on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, like that. And then finally, at the very bottom, the thing is complete. Radha has become master. She stands towering above Krishna, and Krishna has a dark complexion, beloved or lover, whoever what you like to call it, stand there. What am I talking about? What, what is the painter talking about? This whole business of time, flexible, malleable, time <clears throat> which cannot be frozen, it is not from A to Z. It is circular, it can fly in this direction or this direction and so on. So there are depths, there are profundities, there are explorations and so on in these things. Next one, please. If you want to enjoy it, I can, you can link, I can linger over these slides, but I have many more to share with you. Next one, please. Next. Look at this painting carefully. This is a text by the great poet Bihari at the very top. And the text reads, Adhara dharata hari ke parata ot deet pat jot harit baas ki baasuri 
Indradhanush sehot. Meaning what? The moment he puts his flute to his lips, all colors start coming in. The black of his eyes, the red of his lips, the yellow of his garment. And now look at the detail. He is standing, Krishna playing upon his flute in the middle. Two Sakhis, beloveds of his, standing to his left, our right. And they're looking at him. Next one, please. So they just are gazing at him and, and they can't believe the sound that is emanating from his flute. And then if you start noticing the colors in the background, black, red, yellow, gray, it is all the magic of the sound that is being produced at this particular time. To the left, next one, there are other, another group of five gopis, five beloveds. And they're not even looking at him. One of them says, look in that direction. She pointing out in that direction. I'm sorry, next one, please. Yeah, pointing in that direction. And what do you see? Can you see? Next one, please. There. Haritabhasaki Bansuri Indradhanushri Hoth. It turns into a rainbow of colors, this particular atmosphere. Now that, is that a rainbow? Of course not. Or maybe it reminds you of it. So it has become much narrower. It's looking here like the entrance to a cave. The mouth of a cave. And inside it, in the Nathadwara, where you go, they say that there is something called Giri Kandara. There is a kind of a cave through which you enter and you are going to experience things which you never thought are there. It's a cave of experience. It's a discovery. It's completely abandoning any attempt at providing things that you can see with the eyes, but replacing them that you can only see with your mind. Is this a cave of experience? Yes, I think it is. Next one, please. A Mughal painting. The great poet Saadi, along with another mullah seated by his side. Music is going on. And one of the mullahs next to Sadi is thrown up his hands in amaze, in ecstasy as it were. And I was wondering what the ecstasy is about. And I turned the painting on its back and there was a kata by Sadi written there. And I'll recite it for you in Persian. Gili khushbu e dar hamam rozi, rasid az dast e mahbubi vadastam, pahu gufta ke mushki ya abiri, ke man az bu e dilavi iz mastam. Kamal e ham nashi bar man asar kard. Kamal e ham nashi bar man asar kard. I'm sorry, Kumale Hamnashim Barmanas Bhagarna Manham Khakam Kahastam. Meaning what? One day as I was entering the public bath, there were no private baths at that particular time, my beloved handed me a cake of clay. There was no soap at that time. Fine clay in like a tablet. And I put it to my nose. And it smelt so divine, so besotting. Then I asked a question of that, what are you to that piece of clay? Are you musk? Are you ember? That I am so besotted. And out of the kindness of its heart, the cake of clay spoke back to me and said, I'm just a piece of clay. But I remember 
that I come from the same soil where roses used to grow. It is the company that I kept which has made me what I am. Otherwise, I'm just a fistful of dust. Extraordinary. You know, extraordinary utterance. You can say this, good company is a good thing, I mean, like this and so on. But the way Shadi has said it, the way the painter is interpreting it and so on, is some, lifts it to a different level altogether. So basically, what am I saying? Basically, what I'm saying is, this is, these are layered things. Works of art are not simple. They're not only one encounter of the eyes with the object and so on. But you have to enter, visually enter a work of art and see. You know, Fais said, Kai bar is ki khatir zarre zarre ka jigar chira, magar ye chashme haira jiski hairani nahi jati. I've taken a, an atom and sliced it again and again and again. What else is there inside it? Ye chashme haira, but my eyes keep wondering. I have a wondering eye. What else could be inside it? कई बार इस कदामन भर दिया हुसने दोवालम से मगर दिल है कि इसकी खाना वीरानी नहीं जाती countless times have I taken I put the wealth of the two worlds into my heart and my heart manages to remain empty what else can be there this curiosity and this whole business of the layering of works of art and so on what art to my mind, is all about. Next one, please. Next. Krishna has sent a message through his friend Uddhava. Go to Vrindavan and tell these beloveds of mine, I'm not coming back. Uddhava is the most difficult of tasks. And he tries and comes and explains to them. He says, no, 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 he's not coming back. You should now start meditating and so on. And the gopis say, are you mad? Meditation? Are udho, koyal kujat kanan, tum humko upadesh karo ho, bhajma lagao anan. What are you talking about? There is koyal sarava making its beautiful sound in the garden. This is a time of loving and so on, and you are telling us you should put her uh, cross marks on your forehead and bhasma lagavana. Pagal This is a painting of that. Towards the right, one Sakhi says, I see the footprint. He left a message, he's going to come back. And Uddha says, no, 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 meditate. And then one of them says, come. I'll show you something. And then she leads him in that direction. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Next. And she's a beck beckoning Udho, come, I'll show you something. Next one, please. There, in the sky. And she says, you can explain your theory, your, your absolutely useless theories of meditation and so on and so forth. Go and explain that to that cow who's looking up, craning her neck towards the sky and tell her, meditate. Tell her to forget about Krishna. Where is the cow standing? On a mushroom? on a cloud, on a mountain rock, or nowhere. Now these things, I, I may be too easy to be moved by things, but that's what it is. Next one, please. It's a great favorite of mine. Mughal painting. Jahangir period by the great poet and by the great uh, painter Abul Hasan.
Forgive me my weakness for this painting and what I'm going to recite for you. Every time I see this painting, and I must have seen them 234 times or something like that, I'm reminded of a great poem written a few years ago by a poet, Ali Sardar Jafri. Ali Sardar Jafri, and I'll recite the whole poem and translate it for you, should you like it. Ali Sardar Jafri wrote a poem called Mera Safar, My Journey. Somebody must have asked him. And then he says, this is how the poem runs. This man who can't stand by himself, his shaky legs, no light in the eyes, looking at something, nothing in particular in the far distance. Keep this in mind. Next one, please. Yeah. And now listen to the poem by Jafri. Phir ek din aisa aayega, he first describes death. Phir ek din aisa aayega, aankhon ke diye bujh jayenge, haathon ke kamal ko milayenge, aur barge zubaan se nutko sada ki har titli ud jayegi. Death, a day will come. A day will surely come when the lamps of my eyes will begin to grow dim, when the lotuses of my hand will begin to wilt, and from the tongue, my tongue, which is a branch, all butterflies of articulation and speech will fly away one by one by one. एक काले समंदर की तह में फूलों की तरह से खिलती हुई कलियों की तरह से हंसती हुई सारी शक्लें खो जाएंगी ऑल फेसेस दैट आई नो विच आर स्माइलिंग विच आर रेडियंट विल डिसअपियर इन द डार्क डेप्स ऑफ एन ओशन ये मेरी धरती मेरी जमीन हंसती हुई ये हीरे की कनी इसकी सुबह इसकी शामें एक मुश्ते गुबारे इंसान पर शबनम की तरह रो जाएगी दिस अर्थ ऑफ माइंड वेर आई लिव विच आई लव इसकी सुबह इसकी शामें ऑल मॉर्निंग्स ऑल डॉन्स ऑल सनसेट्स ऑल इवनिंग्स विल डिसअपियर will disappear one day phir koi nahi and then dil ki dhadkan khoon ki gardish sab ragniya so jayegi all sounds all musical modes that i hear will disappear what are the sounds that i hear the musical modes dil ki dhadkan the beating of my heart khoon ki gardish the coursing of blood through my veins all of these will fall silent one day फिर कोई नहीं ये पूछेगा सरदार कहाँ है महफिल में नो बट इज गोइंग टू टर्न अराउंड आस वेर दिस दिस मैन गो सरदार एंड देन ही सेज लेकिन मैं यहाँ फिर आऊँगा लेकिन मैं यहाँ फिर आऊँगा बच्चों के दहन से बोलूँगा चिड़ियों की जुबान में गाऊँगा I'll be back here again. I'll speak through the lisping tongues of the newborn and the twittering of the birds in my garden, and so on. जब बीज उगेंगे धरती में और कोंपले अपनी उंगली से मट्टी की तहों को छेड़ेंगी, मैं पत्ती पत्ती कली कली फिर अपनी आंखें खोलूँगा. When seeds begin to tease the surface of the soft soil with their little fingers. I'll open my eyes. I look around. Sar sab zhateli par lekar shabnam ke khatre to lunga. I'll on my green hand. I shall take dew drops and see how much do they weigh. Wonderful description of rebirth coming back. And then he says, "Main rangye hina, ahangye gazal, andaz se sakhun ban jaunga, aur rukhsare uru se nau ki tarre har anchal se chhan jaunga." 
I shall turn into the blush on the cheek of the newly wed bride. I shall turn into the sound of a ghazal and so on so forth. Or jadon ki hawaayin daaman mein jab fasli khida ko laayengi rah rao ke jama qadmo ke tale sukhe huye patto se mere chalne ki sadaayin aayengi. When winter comes and leaves fall and then you hear the crunching sound of leaves under young feet they will be my feet under which the crunching sound will appear aakash ki neeli sab jheele dharti ki sunehri sab nadiyan hasti se meri bhar jayengi all the blue lakes in the sky all the golden rivers that flow on this particular land will be filled with my presence tab sara zamana dekhega har kisa mera afsana hai har aashiq hai sardar yahan har maashooq ka sultana hai and the entire world at that time will see that all stories that are being told are my stories all lovers and beloveds bear the name my name and my wife's name whose name was sultana and then the last four lines are superb he says what am i main ek gureza lamha hu ayam ke afsu khane mein i am one fugitive movement in the wonder house of time मैं एक गुरेजा लम्हा हूँ अयाम के अफसू खाने में मैं एक लरजता खतरा हूँ मसरूफ सफ़र जो रहता है माजी की सुराही के दिल से मुस्तबल के पैमाने में आई एम ए ट्रेम्बलिंग ड्रॉप विच इज़ एट द लिप ऑफ द कराफ ऑफ द पास्ट अबाउट टू बी पोर्ड इन टू द गोबलेट ऑफ फ्यूचर मैं एक लरसता कतरा हूँ ट्रेम्बलिंग देर अबाउट टू ट्रेवल फ्रॉम द पास्ट इन टू द फ्यूचर मैं सोता हूँ और जागता हूँ और जाग के फिर सो जाता हूँ अरे सदियों का पुराना खेल हूँ मैं मैं मर के अमर हो जाता हूँ आई स्लीप i wake up again sleep again this has happened time after time after time i do not die i do not now this poem inevitably without any effort comes to my mind 400 years separate this poem from this particular painting now look at the painting again next one so so professor next goswami one, Professor Goswami. Just, yeah, just one second. <laughs> Next one, please. This is what I am pointing to. Words. Close to his feet, there is a little plant which is coming to flower. In the background, is all gloomy and dark. Five minutes. I am finished. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go back to three slides, please? The full slide. Yeah. Now, when you saw the painting for the first time, you didn't even notice that little plant down there. But you look at it again. You were all concentrated on the man, on the look in his eyes, on the trembling sort of legs and so on and so forth, like that. but then in that gloomy background against that the painter has brought in a tiny little plant flowering promise of rebirth promise of return this is the way it does this is the way it happens this is the way that art in a certain sense you know gets into the deepest layers of your awareness and so on and some things begins to move something begins to stir a poet said when i look at art jumbishe si hai mere seene ke gharon mein kahin i can feel 
in the cave, the inner cave of my inside, my, myself, and so on. There is some stirring, something is happening. Or bani jati hai mahaul mein ek khose jameel. And when I am looking at these works, then maybe the beginning of a forming of a rainbow is out there. The function of art is to set the stirring into your heart, is to start seeing whether a rainbow is forming in the and reveal itself in the cave of experience. I'm very honored by your presence. I've kept to my time, wasted yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. It, it was my regrettable duty regrettable duty to be the timekeeper on this talk um, this has been it has been spell, spellbinding it was I'm so sorry I had to be the timekeeper on this yes. talk but it has been spellbinding joyful thoughtful inspiring it was such a pleasure to hear you speak but I think we still have three minutes <laughs> and Really, but I wish we could also stop the time and he could go on and on. But three minutes to go. I didn't know there was going to be an encore. <laughs> you know, I'm sure many of you have heard the great poet Mir Taqi Mir. Mir Taqi Mir in the 18th century, an extraordinary poet, and some of the people say he's higher than Ghalib. But he said something which comes to my mind when I start talking about art. He's talking about a mirror. Mir taki mir. Mu taka kare hai jis tiska. Hairati hai ye aina kiska. This mirror is now looking at this face, now looking at that face, and is wondering, asking itself a question. Who do I belong to? Who do I belong to? The answer is simple. Belongs to him or her who looks into the mirror. A work of art basically is like that mirror. And it belongs to the person who looks into it. Not at it, but into it. The visual entry into a work of art is of the essence, is really of the essence. The eye is a very wonderful instrument. It can take in 50 paintings in one minute. But if we are patient, if we are eager to learn, if we really wish to, in a certain sense, touch the soul of a work of art, then it will reveal itself. Then it will suddenly set those stirrings into motion which I mentioned a short while ago. No, two minutes ago. Thank you very much. What a lovely, beautiful session. I wish we could go on and on, but thank you so much, B. N. Kwan Swamiji and Yashwani. Thank you. So much. Can you come in the center? They will take a picture. And this is the bamboo, like KBC.
They just the cameraman will take your picture. Dere <laughs> 